I enjoy my life there. I don't have to work. That's one of the most killer experiences in life. So I want to tell you, I'm not just saying this as some little positive thinking technique. I'm telling you, this is the secret, the real secret, to shift it inside of you and to add the real value. Most people are trying to pursue something in the future that they already have. I want you to think of what it is you think you want that will make you wealthy or financially free. Tell me what it is you want from financial freedom. How will you know when you're wealthy? Anyone, tell me. Raise your hand. How will you know when you're truly wealthy? How will you know when you're financially free? Yes, ma'am, right here. When my husband is no longer stressed about financials, finances. That's when you'll be financially free. Right. Then you're probably never going to be free. I know that I need to find out for me what that definition is. And then he will, um, will I guide him? Will you what? Will I guide him to find his own definition then? Well, here's what's interesting. First of all, has she defined this game in a way she has control over, yes or no? No. So the chances of her feeling truly financially free or wealthy are slim to none. Because could they make, have you made more money? Have, how long have you been together, you and your husband? 33 years. 33 years. Wow, give her a hand. Beautiful. By the way, do you love him? I love him so much. Does he love you? Yes. Are you a rich woman? I am the most wealthy woman in the world. Give her a hand for that one for starters, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now notice, if she associates to that part of her wealth, can she get to where she feels rich, yes or no? Yes. And by the way, from that place, she could look at him in a different way and say, isn't it amazing that I have a man that cares so deeply for us that he really wants to make sure we're always doing well in this area? And all his worry is is a way of trying to demonstrate that he wants to take care of me and love me and take care of our family. And how lucky am I? How incredibly rich am I to have a man that cares that much? Would that be a different meaning, yes or no? Would it feel different? But if her view is that he has to give up his worry, she can't control him, number one. Number two, he may think that worry is the way to demonstrate love to himself and other people. And you can get financially free by defining the game in a winnable way. A certain amount of money that we meet, and that covers what we're going to call financial security, which might be your housing, your cars, your food, and basic entertainment. How many would feel rich if you didn't have to work, if your investments alone, the income from your investments, the income, covered those four items, your housing for the rest of your life, your food, right, your travel, and some entertainment. How many think that would feel pretty good? Say, ah. And by the way, that number is way smaller than what most of you think of when you think about being financially independent, which is everything covered without working. So why not get the first one down, Pat? And you're going to know exactly what that number is for you and what it's going to take for that number where you don't have to work to meet it. Then we can look at financial independence, where you don't have to work and everything is covered. Then we go to financial freedom. You don't have to work, and everything you can think of is covered. <laughs> Anything you ever want to do for yourself or others, those you want to give, that's a different level, isn't it? And most people think of financial freedom, they come up with this gigantic number that if you even figured out everything you want, it's nowhere near as big as you think. And because it's so big, you never even start the journey. And you don't think it's going to happen. So you talk about it, you hope you'll get some big hit sometime with your business or something, but you never get going. How many follow this? Say I. So the first thing you've got to do is shift from your wealth being to how he thinks and feels. And if you can do that, that might give him the space to be able to see you're happy. Does that make sense? Yes, give does. her a big hand. Thank you very much. Somebody else. How do you know? How do you know when you're wealthy, when you're financially free? Somebody else. How about this lady right here in the blonde hair? Yes, ma'am. Give her a hand. When... When I have enough money to keep everyone around me fulfilling their dreams. Okay, so when I have enough money to fulfill everyone's dreams around me. How many have learned that whenever people meet a dream, they usually create a new one? So that means, basically, you better never stop anything. Yeah. Right? So you have to fill all of them. And why does it take that for you to be wealthy? I feel sometimes I'm... I hate to word the, use the word luck, but I feel like I'm luckier than those around me. Okay. So, so guilt is part of your motivation? Yes. Okay. 
Well, that coming from guilt, that's an abundant place. <laughs> so the truth is she can never be abundant because she has a belief system inside of her, which is a limitation which says, if I have more than others, there's something wrong. And many people have a thing where I have to give it all away. And it's just not in your head. And that puts me in more stress than I can figure out how to do it again. But the most powerful way we impact other people is we impact them by our example. So don't get me wrong. I mean, I think most of you know, I help feed millions of people each year. I, you know, I do projects in Jerusalem. I do projects all over the world. I love what I get to do with my life. Big into contribution, gigantic. Not just with my words, with my time, not just my money, my time and energy. But I also have learned the balance I didn't know before. Because I used to think I earned love by giving everything. And if I have to give you something for you to love me, then we just made a trade. Mm -hmm. That's not love. That's horse trading. Or there are more direct terms for what that could be called. <laughs> what do you call a person that only loves you if you give them something, like money? Oh, how dare you say such a filthy <laughs> word. But that's really what it is, isn't it? So if you were to make that shift, you could also say, if I try to make everybody else's dream happen, then I get the joy of it. Like, when I was a little kid and I had no money, whenever I went to lunch, I bought lunch for somebody, you know, I found a way, I had to, if I, we went to lunch, I didn't let anybody else buy it. Yeah. And I did that into my early 20s, because it was my way of feeling that I was a giver and not a taker, which made me feel good about myself, right? But I one time went to dinner with this very wealthy man, and he had 10 times more money, but I'm gonna make sure I paid for it. And I still have that basic nature, but here's the balance in me now, I don't have to. Because what happened was this guy grabbed my wrist, and he took the check from me, he said, are you gonna cheat me of the joy I'm gonna have of buying you lunch? He said, are you that selfish? <laughs> and he got my full attention. So it's still, I don't think that pattern of being a giver is gonna leave in you, and I don't think it's a bad pattern. It's out of balance. So she can't be wealthy as long as it's a trade, right? right? If you're coming from abundance, not guilt, and you're saying, wow, I've got abundance, and there are people that I can help make a difference here. Let me help this person, help that person, not because you have to, because you want to, then you're rich. Does that make sense? Yes. Give her a big hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen, right here. Yes, sir. Right here. Yes, sir. Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Uh, wealth for me, financial freedom would be when I have reached a point where I would be somebody that I would look up to in this, this area, the financial area. Okay. A role model. Okay. So I got a question for you. Are you right now a role model for somebody else? Mm. <laughs> Possibly. Yes. Could you be? I could be, yes. Yes. So you've already achieved it, but you're still not wealthy. Well, I'm not my role model. <laughs> but would you be the role model you would have had years ago? Would you be an example of what years ago you would hope for? Now no. you want even more. No, I, I, I'm financially not. In other areas of my life, definitely. Okay, that's fair. So what he's saying is my definition is it has to be something that somebody looks up to. In other words, I need to be significant is the need he wants in financial terms in other people's eyes. And if you are significant in other people's eyes, what will that do for you? Well, you know, it was in my eyes, somebody that I would look, somebody that, but when you know, you an get, example. But, but when you get there, you won't look to yourself anymore. When you get there, you'll just be at a different level, and then you'll be trying to figure some other level of what you need to get to so you would respect yourself. That's a good point. <laughs> he always makes good points. You notice that? <laughs> so what you're doing is, here's the game you're playing, and I want all of you to hear this. No amount of money will ever make you wealthy. Because as soon as you get there, you will raise the game. Now here's what's great about that, to continue growing in all areas of life. If you could grow emotionally, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you could give more, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you grow intellectually, should you? Yes. If you could give more love, should you? Yes. If you could grow more financially, should you? Yes. yes, because growth is life. But having to grow in order to feel significant enough means you will always be poor. It's a game that never ends. So here's the story. Listen carefully. There is this great king. He perceives himself to want to be greater than all of the kings because he wants to do good. So he doesn't want one kingdom, many kings of one kingdom. He wants two. That's right, two kingdoms, two palaces. You know, after all, you need a couple locations to be able to move to. So 
he builds the second kingdom. And for a while, he's pretty excited. For, you know, about a week or a month and until everybody comes and sees his second palace and they go, oh, that's really cool. You have two palaces, you're unbelievable. And he goes, yes, I am a role model for myself. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to last because after a while he thinks, maybe I need a third kingdom. And I've been to both those and it's getting kind of boring. And I mean, I, well, now what do I do? I got two kingdoms. And that's a lot of work to keep kingdoms going, but he doesn't notice that. He doesn't notice he doesn't have as much time or anything else. He's just like busy doing the kingdom thing. And then one day he gets the answer. He hears about this amazing monk. This monk wears a loincloth. He has a blanket. And he goes from city to city and just shares what he believes about God and happiness and life. And people gather around. And most people pass him on the street. He's kind of dirty. He doesn't, he sleeps on the street. And all he has is his blanket, and he only eats food that people give him because he always is adding value, so he doesn't worry. People give him things, and he eats and does well. He has no fear. And he perceives himself to be a very wealthy man. He has one item. He just loves it. It was given to him by his family. It's a, a little lamp, like, kind of like Aladdin's lamp. He keeps it, and he can light it, so if he needs a little heat or a little light to read at night, he can light his little lamp. And the king hears that if you rub this lamp and you ask it for something, unlike Aladdin's lamp where it gives it to you, it gives you twice as much as you've asked for. And the king gets excited. One kingdom becomes two. Yes. He says, bring me this man. He's a beggar. He doesn't need the lamp. He goes around and begs for his food. He lives on the street. Why should he have to carry such a lamp? I can do so much more with it. I could be a role model for myself and others. I could be significant. And so what does he do? He calls and he asks, and sure enough, you know, the monk comes. He's a traveling monk, and what else are you going to do? The king says, come, you come. And he comes and he bows to the king. Says, you are such an amazing role model. You are amazing. What you built, these two palaces, they're beautiful. They're magnificent. They're amazing. I, I'm so grateful to be here. I don't even belong in your presence. And the king says, no, no, I, I'm very fascinated by you. You travel from... Place to place, you don't have one place, you just stay. He goes, no, I travel, meet people, and how do you survive? Well, I love people and share ideas, and people tend to share with me. When you love, you know, you tend to do okay. I, you have nothing, but I understand your loincloth and a blanket and anything else. <laughs> oh, yes, I have this lamp that was given to me by my family. It's just really beautiful. I love it. it it's not, you know, that valuable, but it's just, to me, it's valuable because it was a gift, and it's beautiful. He says, well, that's a rather large lamp that you have to carry around. You know, I have some jewel-encrusted lamps that are much smaller and lighter. You could walk with them much easier. It would be much less of a burden on your back to have to carry this lamp. He says, oh, no, it's no burden. It's very light. He goes, no, no, I really want to give you something much nicer. And he said, uh, please give me your lamp. And he says, well, sir, he said, please. He said, um, I'm so honored to be here with you, but this is a personal gift and I value it not beyond money or what it does or even the heat or anything it'll do. I just value it because of the gift and what it represents. He said, well, I really would like your lamp. He said, sir, I would never deny you anything, um, but I must have integrity with my own relationships, and I, and I must go. And he bows and leaves before the king can respond, and the king goes into a rage. How dare he deny me what I want? How dare he take away something that could give me twice as much of even what I'm asking for? Think of the role model I could be. Think of the good I could do and demonstrate. He doesn't need that. He's poor. He doesn't even ask it for anything. If he would, he'd have two blankets. <laughs> two loincloths. And what would that do? Would that change the world? No. I need the lamp. And he rips himself into a frenzy and he turns to his henchman and says, take the lamp from him. And so they go and they find him in an alley and they beat him up and they steal his lamp. And now, the king is so excited. He tells everyone to leave. He steps into this giant palace bedroom, which is bigger than most people's entire palace. And he sits down, and he rubs the lamp, and he says, Oh, great lamp, give me a hundred pieces of gold. And the lamp says, Oh, great king, absolutely. But why a hundred pieces? Why not two hundred pieces? He goes, Yes. <laughs> it's true. It'll double it. He says, fine, give me 200 pieces of gold. He said, oh, king, why 200 when a king of your nature could have 400 pieces of gold? 
The king says, fine, give me a thousand pieces of gold. Why not 2,000, king? Fine, 10,000. Why settle for 10,000, king? Why not 20,000? A king such as you with two palaces should have at least 10,000. Fine, give me 10,000. Why not 20,000? Fine, give me 100 of the most beautiful women in the world. Why not 200? It will keep you busy. <laughs> and this goes on for hours and hours throughout the night. And the king gets further, further more and more and more intense. And the lamp keeps expanding his point of view. And he keeps thinking, my God, I'm thinking so small. And he has bigger and bigger. And this goes on for three days and nights. He bars the doors and won't let anyone in, just him and his lamp. And he starves to death and dies. And that's the end of the story. I guess, I guess, hello? <laughs> I guess really uh, what it amounts to is um, being able to, to contribute and help and influence yes. in a positive way in somebody's life. What I want to take you away is waiting to become wealthy. Because are there people right now in this world, if I took you to Africa, if I took you to part, plenty of parts of this country, on the streets of many of these cities, if I took you down the street here to San Francisco in the Tenderloin District, is there someone there that right now you could mentor and could change their life financially as well as emotionally, psychologically, and physically with what you already know beyond anything they could imagine, yes or no? Yes. Then don't wait to be wealthy. Start rich and then get financially free as well. Yeah. Give him a hand. Thank you. By the way, is this making sense to you? Do you see why I'm so intense about this? Because I don't want you to go through and get more money and have plenty of money and still not be happy, still not be fulfilled. Until you define the game in winnable ways, you never win. And you chase it, and you die chasing it. That is not to say you shouldn't take your life to a whole nother level financially and have greater choices and greater ways to give gifts, but don't wait. And if you don't wait, if you can own that you're already wealthy, I can promise you you'll get to a level of riches financially 10 times faster than with the identity you have of limitation. Does that make sense? That's the essence of what I'm talking about here. Let's talk about money now, not wealth. We, we, do we agree? All those wealthy in this room right now say aye. aye. And if you really have done what we have, you're not just saying that as some verbalization. You can really feel it. You can feel abundant. You can feel wealthy. From that place, what does it take mechanically to get this thing called financial independence? And what is financial independence as opposed to wealth? Wealth is a product of the mind. Again, no amount of money you ever achieve will make you wealthy. Gratitude will, and living a life where you know you're contributing, adding value will. That's what's going to make you feel wealthy, where you're a giver, not a taker. That doesn't mean you can't receive, but someone who's always looking at what am I getting out of every single thing they do is always poor because they live in scarcity. But if you want to be financially independent, that's different. Financial independent means you never have to work again in order to live your life. That when you do work, you're doing it because you really want to, not because you have to. How many are committed to not only being wealthy, but also financially independent? Say, ah. Yeah. How do we get there? Let me give you the lesson how to get there. It is so simple that when I tell you, you're going to go, thank you for the breakthrough thought. <laughs> but even though you may know this intellectually, whether you're sophisticated or not, you probably know this. Focusing on this is the difference. Can you be a person who is honest in your values and not be honest in the moment? Yes or no? Can you be a loving person but not be loving in this moment, yes or no? Why? Because whatever you focus on, where focus goes, energy flows. So I don't care how sophisticated you are or unsophisticated. If you put focus in what we're going to put in front of you right now, even if you knew it before, you may know it cognitively, but you haven't linked enough emotion to be doing it consistently, or if you are and you're here, you obviously want to do it more and better. And what we're talking about right now is financial wealth, not just wealth as it sense, as an emotion, as a sense. If you want to be financially independent, the formula for financial independence is so simple. And you can't achieve financial abundance unless you really learn to apply this, not just in a concept in your head, but consistently in your life. And that formula is simple. Spend less than you what? You go, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. But is this what most people do, yes or no? No. What do most people spend? More than they earn. There's no way around this. No matter how much money you have, 
If you spend more than you earn, you got a challenge. So there's no way to be financially free, financially independent, without spending less than you earn. And what do you got to do with what you don't spend? You got to invest the difference. Because what I want to show you right now is how do you build what everybody should own. Every one of you should leave here with your own personal money machine. You want to create a money machine. A machine that while you're sleeping, is making you money, right? So you're no longer trading the most valuable resource you have in life, your time for money. You want to trade money for money. You want money to go to work. You want to put that money to work for you so while you're sleeping, it's making a difference. You want to create a machine, and that machine you want to create is something that you want to be able to feed you at some stage where you don't have to work. That's what the money machine is. And so how do you do that? First step, spend less than you earn and invest the difference. Now question, how many of you currently are spending more than you earn? Be honest, raise your hand. How many are spending less than you earn? Raise your hand. Fantastic. Now, if you spend less than you earn but you don't invest it, you're not gonna get much value. Now most of you say, well, I do invest a portion of that. So I might spend more, I do some new spending, but I do invest a portion of it. The second secret to this is you gotta reinvest. How many of you have ever made a big hit in your investments and went, oh my God, that's so cool, and took the money and spent it on something? Raise your hand, say aye. Come on, say aye. I know you all, anybody who's invested has done this. If you got a big hit, you go, oh, this is it. Nothing wrong with that, but you gotta make sure it's significant about that. You reinvest your returns so you get compounded what? Compounded growth is the most basic principle in the world. We all know it intellectually. But are you emotionally associated enough that you're really utilizing it to its maximum capability? If you don't, you're not going to get financially free. You will never get financially independent by your earnings alone. Let me tell you something. There's three or four areas of your life you don't want to go to an expert. You don't want an expert to make the decision. An expert can coach you, but you better make the decision. One is how you raise your kids. I mean, if you're going to screw up, you should be the screw up, not somebody else in this area. Because at least if you screw up, you know you gave your all. And if you screw up, you'll learn from your screw up and you can still make a difference. But letting someone else tell you how to raise your children is insane to think that they know more than you do with your own child, with your own, the soul that you brought into this world. They can coach you, you can learn from them, but you gotta make those decisions. What's another area like that? Your physical health. If you don't learn this area because you think it's too complex, I'm gonna give this decision to somebody else, that somebody else may be totally sincere and sincerely wrong. I'm not lecturing you what to do, I'm just saying whatever you're gonna do, inform yourself and make the decision. Because someone else making that decision, the consequences are too great for your children, for your health. And I'll tell you another area really important, your psychology. Having someone else give you a label, tell you what to do, same thing with, you know, you're going to end up with some challenge in your body, same thing. And the last area, the area I'm talking about here is money. Because what most people do is they go, I don't have time for this, I don't understand this, I need to go to an expert. Because I'm not here to sell you some financial investment or plan. Because if I did that, I'd have a self-interest in the process, that's not going to serve you. And that doesn't mean someone can't sell you something. It just means I'm coming here to advise you on how to make better decisions, not tell you you should do this individual thing. Because what individually you need to do changes. And by the way, even if you have the best intent, can you be wrong, yes or no? So I'm not here as a registered investment advisor. I'm not here to sell you a stock or a bond. I'm here to teach you a way of evaluating so you can make better choices more of the time. Because when you get to the financial area, when you meet somebody, when, what's the old phrase? When a person with experience and knowledge meets a person with money, what happens? The person with the money ends up with experience and the person with the experience ends up with the money. <laughs> and even if the intent is purely positive, if this person screws up, no one is gonna care about as much as your financial world as you, no one. No matter how much they care, no matter how much they're committed because it's your life. And if they make a mistake and they're sincere, they get the learning, which will make them better in the future. But if you make the mistake and you have this concern, you can have the learning. And there's valuable in that. Every one of you in this room is going to lose money. Every one of you. There's no way. The person I work with, one of the top financial traders in the history of the world, top 10 in the history of the world, is not even right half the time. How could you make billions of dollars if you're not even right half the time? Not even 51% of the time. I'm going to show you in a few moments. It's known as asset allocation. It's the way you invest. It's what you do. That's what's gonna shift this. So first step, spend less than you earn, invest the difference. Second step, reinvest it so you get compounded growth until you reach the home run, your money machine, until you reach a critical mass, a critical mass of capital, of investment capital. When you get to that critical mass, and what determines the critical mass is how much you need for the lifestyle that you want. Once you get to that critical mass, what it provides for you is what you're investing for. Who knows 
No matter what investment you're doing, what are you really investing for? Whether you're investing in cars, stocks, bonds, real estate, financial instruments, what are you investing for? You're not, for, you're not investing for returns. That illusion will keep you from getting to the end game. If you're wealthy, here's what makes you wealthy. Income, not assets. Assets you can buy, and assets change in value all the time. You need income. Some people are very wealthy on paper, but they have no liquid assets. And if something happens, they are in deep stuff. How many of you have been in this place, by the way? I'm curious. So you need income. Ultimately, you're trying to build a money machine. If you invest in, let's say, an antique car, and you call it investing, but you're never, ever going to be willing to sell it, it's not an investment, it's an acquisition. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Because what you're really doing is you're wanting this car. You're not wanting to ever make this build your critical mass so you have a money machine so you don't have to work. When you build your critical mass, when you spend less than you earn, and that's the difference, and then as you get compounded growth, you reinvest for even more compounded growth, which we'll walk you through, you're going to eventually get an amount of money that's enough that without working, the interest on that money alone in a secure environment will give you the income so you never have to work again. Then you have a money machine. How many be up for this process? Say, I. That's different than you have X amount of assets on your net worth, which, by the way, can change how fast? How fast? If the marketplace changes what they feel about real estate, if they change what they feel about the companies you've invested in, how fast can all that change? How fast? In a heartbeat. The valuation of the dollar or the pound or the mark or the euro or anything else can change how fast? How many like the idea of building a money machine? Say, I. This is the only reason to invest. You invest for one reason, so you have an income for life without working. And to do that, you've got to build a critical mass of capital that the interest on it alone will give you that income, and you can have the life you want without working. And the only way to do that is do those first two steps. Spend less than you're and invest it, reinvest it till you hit that critical mass. And we're going to show you ways to accelerate that make it happen. That's the entire financial game in one paragraph or one thought. So everybody here's goal is, I, here's what you want to say. I am building a money machine. And its, and its purpose is to give me income for life, income for life. Without, working. without working. Hallelujah. <laughs> how many feel hallelujah on that one? Say I. Yeah. Now, how to do that is actually a lot simpler than you think. We make things more complex than it really is. You got to think of this as your target. Now, by the way, you know whether you're on the path of financial freedom or financial independence or not by can you answer, are you doing the first part? Are you spending less than you earn? And are you investing it? And are you doing the second part? Are you reinvesting and getting compounded growth? And are you moving towards that critical mass that'll get you free? And do you even know what that number is? If it's a general giant number and you keep moving the number, you'll never get there. We have to define, this is what it is. So think of this as the bottom line. In order to achieve what you want, where you have a money machine, here's what you must do. You must pick out a minimum financial goal for yourself, even to achieve your minimum financial goal, you got to pick out a specific amount of money that you're going to invest every month, every year, no matter what. A specific percentage of your income. If you don't do that, forget the rest of this course. It's a waste of your time. Because you'll go make a bunch of money, but you won't be practicing the fundamentals, and eventually you'll make a mistake and you'll lose it. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. If you're going to change things, you really need to put yourself in a position where you say, this is what I'm going to invest. This percentage of my income, where you pay the investments first before you pay all the other bills. Because if you pay the investments first and you keep doing it, it's a pure discipline. And by the way, the best way to do this that I know of is to have that money taken straight out of your account as soon as it gets there. Many of you know you can do it automatically. You can put it in a money market and then decide where to put it. But it literally leaves your account the money and the money is transferred. Think about this. Success in life comes from good judgment. When you make good decisions, you do well. In your relationships, in your body, with your family, and with your finances, with everything. How many agree with me on this? Say I. So if success in life comes from good judgment and good decisions, good judgment often comes from experience. And experience often comes from bad judgment. The secret, that's why we come back to the 80% of psychology, is when you make the mistake and you go, oh my God, my numbers came down, I'm not making progress, instead of going, I can never get there, it's redoubling your efforts. And I'll give you, very often it helps to have a role model, as this man pointed. So I was with Michael Milken 
shortly after he got out of prison. Now, Michael Milken was the junk bond dealer who made billions of dollars for himself and other people during the 1980s. He funded Ted Turner, gave Ted Turner a start. You know, there were all kinds of companies in the 80s that really got their start, all primarily because of this man, Michael Milken. But he also did some things that put him in jail. By the way, in jail, how wealthy do you think he felt? Not very. Now, he was able to keep a significant amount of money. He paid fines. He gave up here in his life, and he got out of jail, and then he developed something called cancer. So what goes the money? So he spent his life starting to figure out how to change, and even though he had a lot of money, he felt like he was starting over in terms of his identity, his respect in the community, the way people look at him. So he began to try to figure out how to do good works, but he was really feeling defeated until he met an interesting guy, a guy named Carl Eller. Because I asked him, at the point I was talking to Michael, later on, I had a lunch with him one time, and he actually wanted to have me put one of my companies into his group and get a piece of it. But the deal wasn't the right deal for me. And I was actually looking back on it, it's been a long time now, it was the right choice not to do it, even though he's a very bright man. But he had the experience, and I had the company and the money. And I realized that they meant I worked out at least that particular investment. I fought it through, and I made fortunately an intelligent choice. I had to move forward. But what I got out of that meeting was worth more than the investment we could have made together. What I got out of that meeting was a role model that I'd like to give you and it could still guide me. And this man, Carl Eller, was his role model. And I said, well, tell me, what's so special about Carl Eller? He said, well, let me give you his history. In 1952, Carl Eller was a man who got involved in outdoor advertising. A young man, he went to work for a company. And as he did this, he worked there for about 10 years at a particular company. Then about 10 years later, 1962, he found himself in a position where he had learned enough and had enough compounded life experience. Does this make sense? 10 years working for somebody else, learning the business, learning to make intelligent choices, that he said, you know what, I'm gonna get a little money, I'm gonna leverage it, and I'm gonna buy my own little company in the outdoor advertising business. And he did that in Arizona. So he buys a little company, outdoor advertising, and he calls it Eller Advertising, or Eller Outdoor, if I remember correctly. What happens next? Well, he takes the next six years of his life, roughly, and he builds that company up. And about six years later, he builds it up enough that now, all of a sudden, he looks at his life and says, I can merge this and get more value. I can work with someone else. I can see what those guys did at the company I worked for. They didn't just do things. They merged with the companies. So he follows the model he learned. And so sure enough, he merges with a local radio and television station there in Arizona. And the value of that company, which was called CCC, grew. Grew immensely. So sure enough, he takes another 10 years. So imagine now he's been running this company six years on his own. Another, he's got 16, 17 years into this now. Do you think you can compound things over 17 years if you make intelligent choices and you're smart? Yes or no? Do you think all the decisions he made were good ones? Yes or no? Did everything he do make money? Yes or no? He failed at many things, but he had the psychology that he learned from everything. And if it didn't work, he said, that's experience. and learn from it, make a better decision. So over the next 16, 17 years, he basically moves into the position where all of a sudden he's in the place where this company has some real value and he sells it with his partners to Gannett, the people that own USA Today, a really large firm. 1980, he becomes chairman of Columbia Pictures. And in a short period of time, from 1980 to 1983, taking what he's learned from the advertising business, he grows Columbia Pictures and he helps them to merge with Coca-Cola. So by 1983, picture this, this man has been working his entire life, right? 52, he got into advertising, it's 83. How many years there, guys? Basically 30 years, right? Three decades. As long as I've been doing what I've been doing, that's how long the gentleman was who accumulated for himself $70 million just by investing in other people's stuff, not even having to do it. You don't have to be a great entrepreneur to make money. You can invest in a great entrepreneur. You know, you can look over at somebody like Bill Gates and say, I'm going to own a piece of him. Let him be the creative one. I don't have to work all around the clock. Let him. So a lot of ways to get wealthier, a lot easier than just running your own business, and many of us love running our own businesses. This man goes good at running his businesses. So by 1983, he's accumulated a net worth of $500 million. 30 years, $500 million. How many think that's pretty good? Say, ah. And by the way, $500 million in 1983. 83 was, you know, decades ago. What's that worth today? I don't know, but probably it's certainly spending power worth more than a billion, that's for sure. So he's got $500 million. So what's he going to do? At this stage, he's, you know, at that stage, I think he was 55, roughly, somewhere in that range, mid-50s. And so he says, well, I got all this money, but I don't have to what? I don't have to. And so he doesn't for a while, but it makes him crazy. 
It's like, I got to do something with my life. I have some meaning. You can only lie on so many beaches. You can only drink so many daiquiris. You know, I mean, I, I want to do something productive. So he comes up with this idea that he's going to take over a company called Circle K. Circle K is a company that stage is doing about 700 million in sales. He goes in and partners and he puts up a chunk of his money, in fact, virtually all of his money to make this deal happen. But he thinks, I'm going to turn this thing around. And guess what? He does. He turns Circle K in roughly five or six years into the second largest convenience store in the world behind 7-Eleven. Second largest in the world. It's got like 4,500 stores in the United States, about 14, 1,500 overseas in like 100 countries. Just an amazing growth record. He takes the company from 700 million in gross sales to over 3.5 billion in gross sales in that short period of time. So now we're really looking really good, wouldn't you say? We're in the early 1990s now. Right? He's done this for six or seven years. He's built this incredible piece. And in two years, the entire company reverses its fortunes and goes bankrupt, and he loses $500 million, everything he's accumulated in 37 years. And he's 62 years old. And he has nothing. He not only has nothing, he owes $100 million at 62. He went from up $500 million to down $100 million. How many of you ever have thought you were in bad financial trouble and it wasn't that bad? Say aye. So you thought, oh, I lost my job, or I lost my income, or my investment went terrible, or the house I bought is not worth as much, or I bought the stock and I lost it, or, you know, I went through a divorce and it was terrible and I lost that. Trust me, this makes anything anybody in this room's ever experienced look like nothing. Now, what do you do when you're 62 years old, you work for roughly almost 40 years of your life, you're up 500 million, everybody respects you, your name is well known, and now you're a total failure or you own $100 million. 99.9% .9 of the planet would go bankrupt, obviously. But he decided there was still time. What was that? Mechanics or psychology, my friends? What did I tell you? 80% of financial freedom, financial independence, and all of wealth is? 20% is? He said, I still have time. At 62, he had the guts to say, all I got to do, I got, I got to get some money, right? I got time, I got to get into compounding again, and I got to make better choices, which at this stage will not be difficult. <laughs> I've made some bad choices here. You know, what took me almost 40 years to develop, I lost in roughly three years, two and a half, three years. But if I could lose in two and a half, three years, I didn't lose the 38 years or 39 years or 37 years or 40 years of what I learned, who I am. So he didn't say, I'm starting over. That was the difference in his psychology. He said, I'm going back to what I know. And at 63, he went back to Phoenix, Arizona and leveraged everything he could possibly get a hold of and got people to invest. And he bought a small outdoor advertising company and started over, but he didn't call it that. He said, I'm going back to what I know, where I can make more intelligent choices. And so what happens? In less than five years, he builds that little company up, and he compounds it in 25 cities, and he builds himself to where, at the age of 68 years old, four and a half years later, actually almost 69 at that stage, if I remember correctly, he now is a billionaire again. He sold his company to, uh, what was the company's name? Um, Clear Channel. He sold his company to Clear Channel and became a billionaire in less than five years. He was never a billionaire after 40 years. Now, this would be a lesson in one thing, mechanics or psychology. Which one? Psychology. psychology. But it's also a lesson in the next most important mechanic you better know. Because everybody's going to make some bad choices, and some of them could cost you seemingly everything. Or you may even make a conscious choice. You're going to change something and... You know, making a change in a relationship can cost you much more than half of what you have, depending on how your life is structured financially. But it may be worth it. How do you not be destroyed by that? You've got to have psychology, but you also want to avoid it. If he was going to be here today, and you're going to ask him, besides your psychology, what was the biggest mistake you made? Your psychology made you well, but what was the biggest mistake you'd make? He would say one thing to you, and I want you to hear it now, and every one of you have heard this, but you may have heard it cognitively, you may even understand it intellectually, but you don't associate enough emotion to it because you're not maximizing it, my guess is, if you're in this room. You could do more. How many agree you could do more in just about anything that matters? Say I. I. And that's called asset allocation. He said, 
the mistake he made was asset allocation. I'm going to show you this now. This is not sexy. This is not completely new for someone sophisticated, but you better make it new for yourself right now. When you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot. You got to get green back on asset allocation. Because what happens is you get to be a sophisticated investor is you tend to look at where can I put my money where I get the largest what? Yeah. Say it again, what? Yeah. And that's the biggest mistake you're going to make in your life. It's counterintuitive, but asset allocation is the single most important decision you're going to make in your financial future. You screw this up, you can do everything else I said well and end up empty financially. Not unwealthy if you stay associated to your psychological strength, but you certainly are not going to be financially free. And this is the mistake he made, asset allocation. What does it mean? It means every person in this room is going to make the wrong decisions financially at times. You're going to get the best advice. You're going to study the past. The history shows that the market is going like this, or the real estate market is going like this, or gold is going like this, or something is going like this. It keeps growing and growing, and you feel like you're missing out if you don't get in. How many felt that recently in some financial valuation of something? Say, I. And so sure enough, you get this piece in you and the fear starts to happen. You don't want to miss out. And everybody's telling you it's the right thing. And it looks like the right thing. And everything should be the right thing. And your timing is wrong. Can you do the right thing at the wrong time? Yes or no? Yes. Let me tell you another secret to life. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, you get pain. <laughs> if you plant in the winter, I don't care how hard you work. I don't care if you work day and night and you work to the bone and you plant your seeds in the middle of the winter, what's going to happen when fall comes? Are you going to be rewarded, yes or no? No. So if you don't understand that the seasons are changing, you're in trouble. But even if you do everything right, you can think it's springtime, can't you? And be wrong. So how do we protect ourselves? The answer is asset allocation. This is the secret you must give yourself. And all of you, I can promise you, in two days, will forget what I'm saying right now. Because in two days, many of you will be making momentum investments, and there'll be somebody in this room who made $3,000 in the last four hours because they're going to make a trade, and someone else will make $100, someone else will make $500, but someone else is going to lose $1,000 or $500. And what most people are going to focus on is the person who made $3,000, and they're, I'm going to put all my money in this momentum investment where I could make this 10% return today, 20% today. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say, ah. And every party goes, that's how I get my money machine. I want to get compounded interest. I want to get the best return I possibly can. And so you put all your money in there. And the worst thing that can happen to you is like when you go to Vegas. What's the worst thing that can happen when you go to Vegas? You win. It's the worst thing that can pop. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say, I. When I was a kid, I was not into throwing my money away because I had so little. And I was not into gambling. It's like I, I wanted to give it, share it, do something fun. Do something that would make people light up. And I ended up going to Vegas with some friends of mine. And they went in, and they all bet. I said, I'm just going to enjoy going to the shows, hanging out with you guys. I'm going to watch. I'm not going to bet. I was, like, very extreme the other side. So what I do, I sat there and watched, and I didn't bet anything until the last day. And the last day, I thought, well, I'll play a little bit of blackjack. I mean, it's easy. It's pretty simple. You, know, you can kind of anticipate the numbers. There's some logic to it. You rationalize the whole thing. And I played blackjack, and I won $1,800 when that was like, I started out with $300. that will give you a perspective. That was like an unbelievable amount of money. Worst thing that could ever happen. Because then once you get that jackpot, what are you always thinking? I'm going to get it again. And that's how they make money in Vegas, because they've set up the compounding on their side. Right? They know what the ratio of results are, and all they got to do is get you to keep doing this, and the house is going to win because the house has the economic advantage. The longer you go, the greater chance you're going to do it. Even if you do it here, you're going to come back. You're going to be desired. That's how they can pay for a, a building like Steve Wynn has that's, what, $2.9 billion to build a hotel. It was the most expensive hotel in the world. Now it's not. They're building a new one for $3.6 billion for a hotel. How can you afford that? You have large margins and profits. And where does that come from? People who got the big hit. So the worst thing can happen is you make investments and you hit a home run. And you hit a home run. And the home run gets you to start thinking you're really smart. And maybe you are really smart. You're very sophisticated. Maybe you really are. But there is a day when the whole game changes. And it's really difficult sometimes to predict that, sometimes impossible. True or false? So the asset allocation is how you protect it. What is asset allocation? It means out of the money you have to invest, we're going to create three buckets. Really simple way of thinking of this from now on. Three buckets. 
And these three buckets are going to help you to understand whatever amount of money you're going to invest each year, where you're going to put it. So for example, if you have, if you don't spend less than you earn, you're going to have nothing to invest. If you spend less than you earn, now you have something to invest, right? Do you need to come up with a specific number, a percentage, or a dollar that you're going to invest every month, every year, if you're going to get to your money machine, yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Where are you going to put that money? Whether it's $100, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000 $1, a year, a $1 million a year, a million a month, doesn't matter. Where you're going to put it, if you're smart, is you're going to put these three buckets of asset allocation. And what are the three buckets? The first bucket is the security bucket. When you think about investing, think of two types of investments. There are fixed income investments, and most of you are clear what this means. What does it mean when it's a fixed income investment? Who knows? What does that mean? You've got a guaranteed rate of return, assuming they deliver. And anyone cannot deliver, including the U.S. government. They haven't not delivered, but they could. Is there risk in any investment, yes or no? So just ratios of risk. And as we know, you know, no risk, no, no reward. So if you don't invest, you're going to lose if you invest the times. But if you don't invest, you've already lost and you can never win, never have a money machine, never be financially free. So fixed income investments, the types of investments you're going to make where there's a guaranteed return. You know, a bond. A company gives you a bond. What is a bond? They're guaranteeing you, you give me your money, I will deliver at this time, at this date, this percentage return to you. So it's fairly what? Secure. Less what? Risky. We all understand this. The second type of investment that you can make, and it helps you understand what you're going to do, is something that's going to be growth-driven. And growth investments are investments where you probably have a much greater potential for growth, which means you get a greater return if you're successful. But if you're not successful, do you have a guaranteed rate of return, yes or no? No. So in a growth investment, you have the potential of greater return, but also greater, greater loss. There is no guarantee in a growth investment. No matter how long it's been going that way, there's no guarantee. We start to get the illusion that it's going to always go up. It isn't necessarily. So where do you put your money if you think of things that are more secure versus not? The security bucket is where you want to put investments that are secure by their nature. Because they're secure, is this going to give you a huge compounded return per year, yes or no? But can it give you a huge compounded return even if the number is small if you do it long enough, yes or no? So what we want to do is your first investments have to be in your security bucket and everybody wants to do the opposite. Because why would you want to go put some money in something you're getting 5%, 6%, 7%, maybe 8% on when you could go do something else that you believe you can make 20% on? Because the 5, 6, 7% is totally guaranteed by that promise, by that government, by that company, by whatever the situation may be. And if you screw up in your growth investments, you've got how much? Zero. What did this man, Eller, do? He put everything in his growth bucket. How many follow what I'm talking about right now? He went, why would I put money in my security bucket? I got $500 million. I can do all these different things. If I put all of it here, I can leverage up and make his goal was to make a billion dollars, right? Instead of losing a half a billion and being 100 million of debt, he ended up losing 600 million total. But he thought, if I put it in there, I don't need to put things in my security bucket. And they might say, well, it all worked out well for him. How many Ellers are there in the world? Most people, when they face financial, what looks like ruin, they say, it's over. I can't start over again at 40 or 50 or 60, much less 63. Very few people would do that. And even if he did, he also had to make some good choices and probably got a little bit of luck. And you get really lucky when you work for 50 years, your gut's out, right? And you won't give up and you'll persist and you have this incredible psychology and you figure out how to add value. But most people wouldn't recover from that. If there's anything he'd do, he wouldn't have, he'd have been worth billions of dollars and wouldn't have had all that stress if all he'd done is put a percentage in a security bucket. The question then becomes, what percentage you put in your security bucket, what goes in there? Well, here's some things that go in there. If you don't have at least two to six months worth of cash that covers your overhead, you're in deep trouble. And today, it's amazing. People with enormous incomes spend most of it. They don't have six months worth of cash on the side. And if something happened where they lost their job, or something happened where the economy got hit, or a terrorist attack occurred, and everything got locked up, they'd be in deep doo-doo. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say I. I. The first step to getting financially secure, not financially independent, is to make sure you got enough cash that if something happens, you can go for six months. You got the freedom. Now, who here already has this set aside for your life? Raise your hand. Fantastic. Give these people a hand, by the way. Big hand for that. Oh, come on, give them a big hand. You're like, yeah, easy for you, you brat. <laughs> 
This has got to be a basic financial goal. Now, nobody wants to do that because it's not sexy. And you're saying, I could be using that money for compounded growth, Tony. Yes, and you could not be compounding, you could lose. And then you're starting with nothing. How many follow me on this? Say I. I. How much of that should go in there? Two to six months, a year? Depends on your psychology. But whatever's going to make you feel secure, it's individual for every person. I'm not going to tell you you should put six months in. Maybe two months is fine for you. Maybe for some of you, you want a year in there. Right? It's different for everybody. This is where you've got to start to know the truth of who you are, not what you project. And some people are more certainty-driven, more and more security-driven than other people. Some people need to have a little more security drive right now in order to keep their life balanced. What else might you put in there? Types of investments. An IRA goes in here, right? Pretty secure. Insurance. The insurance is protecting you. That's part of security. What else could go in there? Your home. Don't think of your home as an investment. Because for most of you, you're eventually not going to sell that home and eat it. You're not going to sell your home and get income off it. Now, some of you may be. You made a stage of life where you're accumulating the same homes, and eventually you're going to sell and buy a smaller home and take that critical mass that came from selling the big home, and it's going to take care of you for life. If you're doing that, great. But the place to think about your home in terms of leverage, put it in your security bucket. How many agree with me on this, by the way? Say I. Because, by the way, if you don't have a home, you're going to be really stressed out. Right? So I've got to think of my growth outside my home, really. Think of your compound interest outside your home. Your home may be a bonus for you. And fixed income investments, often in this category. Now, what's the second bucket? The second bucket is growth. Two ways you're going to learn about growth. The buy and hold strategy, which is the strategy of an owner. And by the way, that buying and holding, that is less risky to some extent than momentum because of the timing. But it can be just as risky. What is momentum trading? That's when you're no longer an owner, you're a trader. A financial trader, everybody's a financial trader. Most of you are trading time for your money. Here you're trading money for money. Here what you're looking at is you're seeing movement in prices that may or may not have anything to do with value. Can a price change just on, based on perception of a company, yes or no? Can perception change the price or the value of real estate, yes or no? A little or completely? But very often, there's a fluctuation that can come from an event, from a perception, and what a momentum player is doing is they're playing for the short term usually. They're in and out when that fluctuation happens. They're betting on the up or the down. Because as momentum players, I want you to understand something. Everything we're going to teach you will work in a bull market or a bear market. I it would be irresponsible to teach you a set of principles that are based on a market only being bull, because right now in the country you live in, it's a bull market in real estate or stocks or gold or silver or whatever it is. That's irresponsible. You want to be able to make money no matter what happens in the market. How am excited about this, by the way? Say, I. <laughs> But even if you get brilliant, even if you do it, can your timing be wrong, yes or no? Yes. yes. Can you be totally smart and make the wrong decision, yes or no? Yes. So what is going to protect you so you milled your money machine no matter what, and when it's time and you don't want to work, you're going to get there? What bucket's going to protect you? It grows slowly, and it grows like the grass. So how much should we put in our security? And by the way, you say, well, what's the third bucket, Tony? Well, there's the security bucket where we put our money first. Second bucket, growth bucket, we put our money second. And we put a percentage in there all the time. Third bucket is the dream bucket. The dream bucket is you want to travel around the world. The dream bucket is you, depending upon the size of how you think or what you're doing or your economics, you want to own a condominium in Aspen. And if Aspen seems insane at $2,000 a square foot, then you might say, I want one in Mammoth, you know, or I want one in Chile, you know, I want someplace else. Many times you get the same thing or better quality just by changing location because of perception. And it isn't any better or worse. You're trying to get financially fee and real critical, critical mass so that you can live forever in your own home in Los Angeles or you move to Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon's greener, richer, you know, probably not going to be the first place bombed in a terrorist attack. Right? Could you have as good or greater quality of life for a third or fourth the price, yes or no? Yes. So sometimes you can get to your goal quicker just by changing locations, changing your perception of where you need to be, breaking your own pattern. Okay? So security bucket gets full, growth bucket, but what's the dream bucket? The dream bucket might be a second home, it might be the boat, it might be a trip, it might be owning a basketball team, owning an island, depends on the size of what it is you want to do. And by the way, bigger isn't better. The more you have to have to feel financially free, the more stress you're going to have. How many follow this? It's the opposite of what you think. The more you have, the more you've got to manage, the more time, the more energy, the more risk, the more capital. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Some of you are very, very driven to create and risk. That's a personality type. We know it's crazy. <laughs> I happen to be one of those types to some extent. 
But even a crazy person's got to make sure their security's there or their craziness at one point will bite them. How many follow? If you can get financially free for less, do it. Be wealthy now and get financially free quicker. And then walk in, you won. And then keep that stuff in your security bucket. If you want to play a bigger game now, you've already won and everything you're playing now, that's where the house is money. You can go for something bigger and if, you, if it doesn't work out, you're still handled. Your security, what you're here for is totally free. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. Now, how do we decide to fill these up? Well, your stage of life plays a role. So in your security area, if you're really getting started here and you don't have the security there, if you're really conservative, you probably need to put 40% of your investment capital there. 40% so you're totally protected. If you're more aggressive, maybe 30%. By the way, which one of these three buckets do most people try to fill first? One, two, or three? Three. And how do they do it? Borrow money. And what they buy it usually isn't a real asset. It breaks down in value. The car, you know, the secondary home in an environment that the market changed, whatever it is. They don't usually make money on it long term. They usually lose money. And then they have no financial freedom. So they got to go work. I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm happy, I have love, I have all these things. Nothing wrong with that, but why not have both? What do you think the second one is to be filled for most people? What's the second one? Quick. Growth. They go for growth, because why? I want a bigger what? Return. But a bigger return potential brings with it greater what? Risk. You absolutely want to fill your growth bucket, just make your security bucket the first one. Because it's the one you want to fill least, and it's the one that will protect you. You want to learn from Carl. You don't want to wake up and say, I'm starting over. You don't want to have to use that psychology. Great if you could, but use that along the way when you make mistakes, not when you lose everything. That's what Carl will tell you. If Carl was here to support you right now, he would say to you, listen to this man. Listen to him. I know it's boring sounding right now. I know it's not exciting, but this is your life. Spend less than you earn. Invest the difference. Reinvest for compounded interest, but do it in these three buckets and do it in the first two first. Here's how I do it. Pick your percentage. Don't vary when you get a better opportunity. So if you're going to invest $1,000 a month, $10,000 a year, what are you going to do with it? You're going to say four of that's going to my security bucket, six of that's going to my growth. And after the next few days, you're going to decide how much of that's buy and hold, how much of that is momentum, where you're going to put that. Is it going to be in real estate buy and hold? Is that going to be in companies? You're going to break it up. But you keep the percentage because otherwise someone will offer you a deal. And when that deal comes up and you see the opportunity, what are you going to say? I need to get more, so I'm going to take from my security bucket and do it, and that's when you get bit. I know I sound like I'm lecturing to you. I'll tell you why. Do you know how many people I've taught this to? The millions of people over the years that I've shared this with, and you know how few people really hear me? They hear me right now, but the minute their greed gets hit, the minute they go, oh my God, I got this giant return, they douse this. So if this feels heavy, that's okay with me. If this doesn't feel sexy, that's okay with me. But remember what I'm telling you. What is the secret long term? What's the most important decision you're going to make in your investment life? Your, say it again, your. So right now, so this goes from conversation to reality. I want to ask you this. What percentage of your current investments are in completely secure environments? If the answer is zero, this is the first thing you've got to do. You can still do great opportunities, but that percentage has got to start building security first, a percentage of it. And again, that number depends on your risk tolerance, and it depends, secondly, on where you are on stage of life. If you're older, does you need to put more in security or less? Which one? Quick. More, because you have less time to make up for a mistake. If you're younger, you can put a little less, but don't put nothing. And if you become more wealthy, you know what's interesting? The richer you think and feel, the more abundant you seem to become, because that feeling starts to affect the way you make decisions. They're not made from fear, they're made from gratitude. And when you operate from gratitude, and you're coming from a generous place within yourself and other people, it attracts a different experience. You know what's crazy in my life today? Today, people come up to me every day of my life, no exaggeration, if I'm in the public, if I'm in a restaurant, and because I've had, you know, 50 million people get my books and tapes around the earth, no matter where I go in the world, people might come up and tell me these great stories, but someone will come over to me and they'll say, they just paid for your dinner or your lunch or whatever, or they want to buy this. And I'll say, no, 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 they go, no, they insist. I'm saying, no, 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 I'll go and say, thank you. I really appreciate it, but thank you. I appreciate the gift of wanting to do it, but please let me take care of this. No, 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 no. I'm thinking, where were these people when I was broke at Denny's? <laughs> and where were they when I needed them? When you're rich, everybody wants to buy you lunch and dinner. When you're successful and wealthy, everybody wants to do for you. 
When you're not, ironically, no one wants to do a squat for you. Except a few people that feel sorry for you or want to be generous in some way, but the majority don't. It's ironic. The more successful, the more happy, the more healthy, the more wealthy you become, you get momentum. And other people are attracted to you. Deals, opportunities, experiences. So 80%, I've said it a million times because I want you to get it in your body, is this association. So will you give everybody a hand for this day, for starters, everybody a hand for this day. Amazing. such an amazing role model. You're amazing. What you built, these two palaces, they're beautiful, they're magnificent, they're amazing. I, I'm so grateful to be here. I don't even belong in your presence. And the king says, no, no, I, I'm very fascinated by you. You travel from place to place. You don't have one place, you just stay. He goes, no, I travel, meet people. And How do you survive? Well, I love people and share ideas and people tend to share with me. When you love, you know, you tend to do okay. I, you have nothing but, I understand, your loincloth and a blanket and anything else? <laughs> oh, yes, I have this lamp that was given to me by my family. It's just really beautiful. I love it. it. It's not, you know, that valuable, but it's just, to me, it's valuable because it was a gift. And it's beautiful. He says, well, that's a rather large lamp that you have to carry around. You know, I have some jewel-encrusted lamps that are much smaller and lighter. You could walk with them much easier. It would be much less of a burden on your back to have to carry this lamp. He says, oh, no, it's no bird. It's very light. He goes, no, no, I really want to give you something much nicer. And he said, uh, please give me your lamp. And he says, well, sir, he said, please. He said, um, I'm so honored to be here with you, but this is a personal gift, and I value it not beyond money or what it does or even the heat or anything it'll do. I just value it because of the gift and what it represents. He said, well, I really would like your lamp. He said, sir, I would never deny you anything, um, but I must have integrity with my own relationships, and I, and I must go. And he bows and leaves before the king can respond. And the king goes into a rage. How dare he deny me what I want? How dare he take away something that could give me twice as much of even what I'm asking for? Think of the role model I could be. Think of the good I could do and demonstrate. He doesn't need that. He's poor. He doesn't even ask it for anything. If he would, he'd have two blankets. <laughs> two loincloths. And what would that do? Would that change the world? No! I need the lamp. And he whips himself into a frenzy and he turns to his henchman and says, take the lamp from him. And so they go and they find him in an alley and they beat him up and they steal his lamp. And now the king is so excited. He tells everyone to leave. And he steps into this giant palace bedroom which is bigger than most people's entire palace. And he sits down and he rubs the lamp and he says, oh great lamp, Give me a hundred pieces of gold. And the lamp says, oh, great king, absolutely. But why a hundred pieces? Why not 200 pieces? He goes, yes. <laughs> it's true, it'll double it. He says, fine, give me 200 pieces of gold. He said, oh, king, why 200 when a king of your nature could have 400 pieces of gold? The king says, fine, give me a thousand pieces of gold. Why not 2,000 kings? Fine, 10,000. Why settle for 10,000, king? Why not 20,000? A king such as you with two palaces should have at least 10,000. Fine, give me 10,000. Why not 20,000? Fine, give me 100 of the most beautiful women in the world. Why not 200? It will keep you busy. <laughs> and this goes on for hours and hours throughout the night. And the king gets further, further more and more and more intense. And, the lamp keeps expanding his point of view and he keeps thinking, my God, I'm thinking so small and he has bigger and bigger. And this goes on for three days and nights. He bars the doors and won't let anyone in, just him and his lamp. And he starves to death and dies. And that's the end of the story. I guess, I guess, hello? <laughs> I guess really, uh... 
I enjoy my life. I don't have to work. That's one of the most killer experiences in life. So I want to tell you, I'm not just saying this as some little positive thinking technique. I'm telling you, this is the secret, the real secret, to shift it inside of you and to add the real value. Most people are trying to pursue something in the future that they already have. I want you to think of what it is you think you want that will make you wealthy or financially free. Tell me what it is you want from financial freedom. How will you know when you're wealthy? Anyone, tell me. Raise your hand. How will you know when you're truly wealthy? How will you know when you're financially free? Yes, ma'am, right here. When my husband is no longer stressed about financials, finances. That's when you'll be financially free. Right. Then you're probably never going to be free. I know that I need to find out for me what that definition is. And then he will, um, will I guide him? Will you what? Will I guide him to find his own definition then? Well, here's what's interesting. First of all, has she defined this game in a way she has control over, yes or no? No. So the chances of her feeling truly financially free or wealthy are slim to none. Because could they make, have you made more money? Have, how long have you been together, you and your husband? 33 years. 33 years. Wow, give her a hand. Maybe. And by the way, do you love him? I love him so much. Does he love you? Yes. Are you a rich woman? I am the most wealthy woman in the world. Give her a hand for that one for starters, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now notice, if she associates to that part of her wealth, can she get to where she feels rich, yes or no? Yes. And by the way, from that place, she could look at him in a different way and say, isn't it amazing that I have a man that cares so deeply for us that he really wants to make sure we're always doing well in this area? And all his worry is is a way of trying to demonstrate that he wants to take care of me and love me and take care of our family. And how lucky am I? How incredibly rich am I to have a man that cares that much? Would that be a different meaning, yes or no? Would it feel different? But if her view is that he has to give up his worry, she can't control him, number one. Number two, he may think that worry is the way to demonstrate love to himself and other people. And you can get financially free by defining the game in a winnable way. A certain amount of money that we meet, and that covers what we're going to call financial security, which might be your housing, your cars, your food, and basic entertainment. How many would feel rich if you didn't have to work, if your investments alone, the income from your investments, the income, covered those four items, your housing for the rest of your life, your food, right, your travel, and some entertainment. How many think that would feel pretty good? Say, ah. And by the way, that number is way smaller than what most of you think of when you think about being financially independent, which is everything covered without working. So why not get the first one down, Pat? And you're going to know exactly what that number is for you and what it's going to take for that number where you don't have to work to meet it. Then we can look at financial independence, where you don't have to work and everything is covered. Then we go to financial freedom. You don't have to work, and everything you can think of is covered. <laughs> Anything you ever want to do for yourself or others, those you want to give, that's a different level, isn't it? And most people think of financial freedom, they come up with this gigantic number that if you even figured out everything you want, it's nowhere near as big as you think. And because it's so big, you never even start the journey. And you don't think it's going to happen. So you talk about it, you hope you'll get some big hit sometime with your business or something, but you never get going. How many follow this? Say I. So the first thing you've got to do is shift from your wealth being to how he thinks and feels. And if you can do that, that might give you... What it amounts to is um, being able to, to contribute and help and influence yes. in a positive way in somebody's life. What I want to take you away is waiting to become wealthy. Because are there people right now in this world, if I took you to Africa, if I took you to pff, part, plenty of parts of this country, on the streets of many of these cities, if I took you down the street here to San Francisco in the Tenderloin District, is there someone there that right now you could mentor and could change their life financially as well as emotionally, psychologically, and physically with what you already know beyond anything they could imagine, yes or no? Yes. Then don't wait to be wealthy. Start rich and then get financially free as well. Yeah. Give him a hand. Thank you. By the way, is this making sense? Do you see why I'm so intense about this? Because I don't want you to go through and get more money and have plenty of money and still not be happy, still not be fulfilled. Until you define the game in winnable ways, you never win. And you chase it, and you die chasing it. 
That is not to say you shouldn't take your life to a whole other level financially and have greater choices and greater ways to give gifts, but don't wait. And if you don't wait, if you can own that you're already wealthy, I can promise you you'll get to a level of riches financially 10 times faster than with the identity you have of limitation. Does that make sense? That's the essence of what I'm talking about here. Let's talk about money now, not wealth. We, we, do we agree? All those wealthy in this room right now, say aye. aye. And if you really don't what we have, you're not just saying that as some verbalization. You can really feel it. You can feel abundant. You can feel wealthy. From that place, what does it take mechanically to get this thing called financial independence? And what is financial independence as opposed to wealth? Wealth is a product of the mind. Again, no amount of money you ever achieve will make you wealthy. Gratitude will, and living a life where you know you're contributing, adding value will. That's what's going to make you feel wealthy, where you're a giver, not a taker. That doesn't mean you can't receive, but someone who's always looking at what am I getting out of every single thing they do is always poor because they live in scarcity. But if you want to be financially independent, that's different. Financial independent means you never have to work again in order to live your life. That when you do work, you're doing it because you really want to, not because you have to. How many are committed to not only being wealthy, but also financially independent? Say, I. I. How do we get there? Let me give you the lesson how to get there. It is so simple that when I tell you, you're gonna go, oh, thank you for the breakthrough thought. <laughs> but even though you may know this intellectually, whether you're sophisticated or not, you probably know this. Focusing on this is the difference. Can you be a person who is honest in your values and not be honest in the moment, yes or no? Can you be a loving person but not be loving in this moment, yes or no? Why? Because whatever you focus on, where focus goes, energy flows. So I don't care how sophisticated you are or unsophisticated. If you put focus in what we're going to put in front of you right now, even if you knew it before, you may know it cognitively, but you haven't linked enough emotion to be doing it consistently, or if you are and you're here, you obviously want to do it more and better. And what we're talking about right now is financial wealth, not just wealth as it sense, as an emotion, as a sense. If you want to be financially independent, the formula for financial independence is so simple. And you can't achieve financial abundance unless you really learn to apply this, not just in a concept in your head, but consistently in your life. And that formula is simple. Spend less than you what? You go, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. But is this what most people do, yes or no? No. What do most people spend? More than they earn. There's no way around this. No matter how much money you have, if you spend more than you earn, you've got a challenge. So there's no way to be financially free, financially independent, without spending less than you earn. And what do you got to do with what you don't spend? You've got to invest the difference in the space to be able to see you're happy. Does that make sense? Yes, Give does. her a big hand. Thank you very much. Somebody else. How do you know? How do you know when you're wealthy, when you're financially free? Somebody else. How about this lady right here in the blonde hair? Yes, ma'am. Give her a hand. When I have enough money to keep everyone around me fulfilling their dreams. Okay, so when I have enough money to fulfill everyone's dreams around me. How many have learned that whenever people meet a dream, they usually create a new one? So that means, basically, you better never stop anything. Yeah. Right? So you have to fill all of them. And why does it take that for you to be wealthy? I feel sometimes I'm... I hate to word the, use the word luck, but I feel like I'm luckier than those around me. Okay. So, so guilt is part of your motivation? Yes. Okay. Well, that, coming from guilt, that's an abundant place. <laughs> so the truth is she can never be abundant because she has a belief system inside of her, which is a limitation which says, if I have more than others, there's something wrong. And many people have a thing where I have to give it all away. And she's not in her head. <laughs> And that puts me in more stress, then i got to figure out how to do it again. But the most powerful way we impact other people is we impact them by our example. So don't get me wrong, I mean, I think most of you know, I help feed millions of people each year. I, you know, I do projects in Jerusalem, I do projects all over the world. I love what I get to do with my life. Big into contribution, gigantic. Not just with my words, with my time, not just my money, my time and energy. But I also have learned the balance I didn't know before. Because I used to think I earned love by giving everything. And if I have to give you something for you to love me, then we just made a trade. Mm -hmm. That's not love. That's horse trading. Or there are more direct terms for what that could be called. <laughs> what do you call a person that only loves you if you give them something, like money? 
Oh, how dare you say such a filthy <laughs> word. But that's really what it is, isn't it? So if you were to make that shift, you can also say, if I try to make everybody else's dream happen, then I get the joy of it. Like, when I was a little kid and I had no money, whenever I went to lunch, I bought lunch for somebody, you know, I found a way, I had to, if I, we went to lunch, I didn't want anybody else to buy it. Yeah. And I did that into my early 20s, because it was my way of feeling that I was a giver and not a taker, which made me feel good about myself, right? But I one time went to dinner with this very wealthy man, and he had 10 times more money, but I'm gonna make sure I paid for it. And I still have that basic nature, but here's the balance in me now, I don't have to. Because what happened was this guy grabbed my wrist, and he took the check from me, he said, are you gonna cheat me of the joy I'm gonna have of buying you lunch? He said, are you that selfish? <laughs> and he got my full attention. So it's still, I don't think that pattern of being a giver is gonna leave in you, and I don't think it's a bad pattern. It's out of balance. So she can't be wealthy as long as it's a trade, right? right? If you're coming from abundance, not guilt, and you're saying, wow, I've got abundance, and there are people that I can help make a difference here. Let me help this person, help that person, not because you have to, because you want to, then you're rich. Does that make sense? Yes. Give her a big hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen, right here. Yes, sir. Right here. Yes, sir. Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Uh, wealth for me, the financial freedom would be when I have reached a point where I would be somebody that I would look up to in this, this area, the financial area. Okay. A role model. Okay. So I got a question for you. Are you right now a role model for somebody else? Mm. <laughs> Possibly. Yes. Could you be? I could be, yes. Yes. So you've already achieved it, but you're still not wealthy. Well, I'm not my role model. <laughs> but would you be the role model you would have had years ago? Would you be an example of what years ago you would hope for? Now no. you want even more. No, I, 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 I'm financially not. In other areas of my life, definitely. Okay, that's fair. So what he's saying is my definition is it has to be something that somebody looks up to. In other words, I need to be significant is the need he wants in financial terms in other people's eyes. And if you are significant in other people's eyes, what will that do for you? Well, you know, it was in my eyes, somebody that I would look, somebody that, but when you know, you an get, example. But, but when you get there, you won't look to yourself anymore. When you get there, you'll just be at a different level, and then you'll be trying to figure some other level of what you need to get to so you would respect yourself. That's a good point. <laughs> he always makes good points. You notice that? <laughs> so what you're doing is, here's the game you're playing, and I want all of you to hear this. No amount of money will ever make you wealthy. Because as soon as you get there, you will raise the game. Now here's what's great about that, to continue growing in all areas of life. If you could grow emotionally, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you could give more, should you? Yes or no? Yes. If you grow intellectually, should you? Yes. If you could give more love, should you? Yes. If you could grow more financially, should you? Yes. yes, because growth is life. But having to grow in order to feel significant enough means you will always be poor. It's a game that never ends. So here's the story. Listen carefully. There is this great king. He perceives himself to want to be greater than all of the kings because he wants to do good. So he doesn't want one kingdom, many kings of one kingdom. He wants two. That's right, two kingdoms, two palaces. You know, after all, you need a couple locations to be able to move to. So he builds a second kingdom. And for a while, he's pretty excited. For, you know, about a week or a month and until everybody comes and sees his second palace and they go, oh, that's really cool. You have two palaces, you're unbelievable. And he goes, yes, I am a role model for myself. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to last because after a while he thinks, maybe I need a third kingdom. And I've been to both those and it's getting kind of boring. And I mean, I, well, now what do I do? I got two kingdoms. And then it's a lot of work to keep kingdoms going, but he doesn't notice that. He doesn't notice he doesn't have as much time or anything else. He's just like busy doing the kingdom thing. And then one day, he gets the answer. He hears about this amazing monk. This monk wears a loincloth. He has a blanket. And he goes from city to city and just shares what he believes about God and happiness and life. And people gather around. And most people pass him on the street. He's kind of dirty. He, doesn't, he sleeps on the street. And all he has is his blanket. And he only eats food that people give him because he always is adding value, so he doesn't worry. People give him things, and he eats and does well. He has no fear. And he perceives himself to be a very wealthy man. He has one item 
He just loves it. It was given to him by his family. It's a, a little lamp, like kind of like Aladdin's lamp. He keeps it, and he can light it, so if he needs a little heat or a little light to read at night, he can light his little lamp. And the king hears that if you rub this lamp and you ask it for something, unlike Aladdin's lamp where it gives it to you, it gives you twice as much as you've asked for. And the king gets excited. One kingdom becomes two. Yes. He says, bring me this man. He's a beggar. He doesn't need the lamp. He goes around and begs for his food. He lives on the street. Why should he have to carry such a lamp? I can do so much more with it. I could be a role model for myself and others. <laughs> I could be significant. And so what does he do? He calls and he asks, and sure enough, you know, the monk comes. He's a traveling monk, and what else are you going to do? The king says, come, you come. And he comes and he bows to the king.